So good evening everybody. This is my take on astrophotography. The idea being what can you photograph in the sky without using ridiculously expensive equipment and ultimately what can you do for instance without a telescope. So what do you need? Well we're going to start simple and then work our way up. So to start with we're just going to look at what you can do with a camera and a tripod and then I'll have a quick look at what you can do with telescopes but I'm not going to dwell on that for too long because I'm trying to veer away from expensive equipment. So I'll be talking about what you can do with the camera that you might already own and one way of getting nice pictures of the sky is to use a star tracker. I'll be looking at a few of my images using those as illustrations and I'll finish with some images that I've taken from the nice dark skies of a safari in Africa. So let's start simple, just a camera and a tripod. So this is possibly where I started many many years ago with slide emulsion film taking a picture from not far from the uh, city of Petra. I was out in the desert and decided to try and take a picture of the sky. Something of order, a five minute exposure and the stars have just started to trail and right in the centre of the image there you can see Polaris and you can see very short star trails due to the Earth's rotation. But with digital photography rather than taking a long exposure of many minutes or possibly many hours with digital photography we now have the option of not exposing for a very long time but taking a series of short exposures. For instance this was a series of 60 second exposures and I took a number of them over a few hours and then software allows you to stitch them all together. There's free software that can do that for you if you're not particularly computer savvy. There are applications that will basically take all of your images and produce star trails. The advantages of taking a lot of short exposures and adding them together is that if one of the images is spoilt by perhaps a passing aircraft or something else like that, then that can be eliminated from the set. It also means that you can actually put them together into a movie rather than actually make a static image of a star trail. You can actually make a movie of the stars rotating around the pole. In this particular case this was taken from the Canary Islands so Polaris is relatively low on the horizon. There it is just above one of the observatories of uh, taken at Tidy Observatory on Tenerife. The sky is quite blue rather than black, not because it's not a clear sky, but because there's a full moon there, uh, effectively over our left shoulder. There's a full moon which is producing a little bit of blue in the sky and it's also illuminating the green grass in front of us and illuminating the white domed buildings as well. So star trails, very easy. Essentially all you need is a camera and somewhere firm to put it, ideally a tripod but even that isn't strictly necessary and you just need to have some way of being able to take a series of relatively short exposures, perhaps 30 seconds, perhaps a minute or so. There are other images that can be taken without the need to worry about the rotation of the earth and hence the motion of the sky. For instance Comet Holmes visited us some what was it 15 or so years ago and Comet Holmes was large enough that again you don't need a telescope just a telephoto lens on a camera was enough and because it was a relatively bright comet exposure could be relatively short in this case about 30 seconds or so and so again this is a static picture a static camera on a static tripod and we don't have to worry too much about the stars trailing over a relatively short uh, period of time so providing the object is bright then we can get some nice images without worrying about equatorial mounts and tracking the stars. Other pictures we can take that uh, produce nice aesthetic images are for instance if you're in the right place at the right time uh, which usually means going a little bit further north than uh, the United Kingdom if you go far enough north you're likely to pick up the northern lights. In this particular case this was from Iceland and again this was in the pre-digital days. This was going back to the early noughties when I was still using a 35mm camera. This was slide film and because the sensitivity wasn't fantastic in this slide film I had to expose for quite a while, a few minutes. 
which means unfortunately some of the fine detail that you see in the auroral curtains got a little bit washed out. So I would like to go back to Iceland one day with a digital camera where it should be possible to take shorter exposures and see some of the fine detail uh, and, and the motion of the, uh, the curtains, the auroral curtains, that couldn't really be picked up in a, in a long exposure of a few minutes. So the auroral display was quite fantastic and it was wonderful to see over many hours effectively the aurora lighting up the entire sky from about nine o'clock in the evening eventually the entire sky was glowing green. You can see that you can still see some stars through the aurora uh, again an exposure of a few minutes you can see a little bit of Orion coming through on the left with the slightly orangey Betelgeuse view there and close to the centre of the image you can probably see the Pleiades, the, the Seven Sisters, just appearing in the middle of the frame there. Another right place at the right time, which doesn't require any fancy equipment, is a solo eclipse. But unfortunately it usually involves travel. You can't simply stay put and expect a solar eclipse to come to you, not a total eclipse of the sun at least. If you're prepared to travel, then a total eclipse of the sun is one of the most awesome sights you can possibly ever experience. In this particular case, some friends and I went to the Sahara Desert in 2006 and caught this wonderful view of the, uh, the, um, the coronal structure, which can be brought out in a number of different exposures. A long exposure will bring out the outer parts of the corona but will saturate the bright inner part of the corona and a short exposure will show the inner part nicely but won't show up the filigree structure in the outer. So in this particular case I had to take a number of different exposures of different lengths and then add them all together digitally um, in order to produce the picture which shows most of the structure you can actually trace out the magnetic field lines in the corona of the sun and even some of the loops that seem to be looping around some prominences close to the limb of the, of the moon there. But of course you can't choose a solar eclipse other than find out where they are and go and chase them. You can't just sit back and assume that you can get a total eclipse of the sun as seen from England, not for many many decades to come. But when they do occur you don't need fancy equipment, just a camera with a telephoto lens on a static tripod is all you really need. So let's have a think and go beyond just a camera on a tripod, even though that can produce some wonderful images. Let's have a look at some slightly more expensive equipment before moving back to cheaper stuff. So if your budget stretches to it, you can keep an eye on eBay because sooner or later the Hubble is going to come to the end of its life. It's been doing wonderful work for the last 30 or so years, but it's not going to last forever. So if you want to put in a bid, keep an eye on eBay, you never know. If you've got a few billion dollars to spare, then you can get wonderful images such as I'm sure you've seen these sorts of images over the last 30 years or so. Fantastic resolution because the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, is above the Earth's atmosphere. If you don't stretch to a few billion dollars and you only have a few hundred million, well, why not buy yourself a 747 with a telescope in the back? Still relatively expensive for most of us, but it's the same idea, get above most of the atmosphere. In this case, not above all of it, but for this particular case, for infrared astronomy, if you can fly high enough, you can get above most of the uh, Earth's atmosphere and still get some wonderful images. But that's still a little bit on the pricey side, given that we're supposed to be talking about inexpensive ways of doing astrophotography. For a few million pounds you can buy yourself a robotic telescope like the Liverpool telescope which is sitting on the island of La Palma which gives some wonderful images. But bear in mind you don't have to buy a telescope like this, you can simply use one. There are various robotic telescopes around the world which have access either for astronomical societies or educational purposes or for any individuals a small fee would be charged to take images on telescopes around the world. For a lot of amateurs, they might choose to buy themselves a telescope in the range of a few hundred to many, many thousands of pounds. And some people delight in the idea of buying themselves a telescope 
That's what it might look like when it comes out of the box on the left hand side, but sooner or later people are going to add technology onto it and it will soon become a spaghetti of technology where they've added cameras and heaters and other gadgets and some people don't stop until the entire telescope is absolutely covered with technology. So if that's your bag, if that's what you like to do, if you like technological solutions, that's definitely a way to go. And when it comes to astrophotography, many people will tell you that what's really important is to get the most stable mount you can possibly get. If the mount is absolutely stable, then you can put a big telescope or camera system on that and track the sky reliably. That is indeed true, but it's often beyond people's pockets. When you say that the mount that you really want is something like this one, which might sell for something like $10,000 or so, you ask yourself, well, that is certainly something that you can aspire to, but do you need something like that to actually get engaged with astrophotography? If you did decide to buy yourself a telescope, where are you going to put it? It would be wonderful to have a, a nice dome in the back garden like this one at Palomar Mountain. This is the, uh, the dome of the 5 meter telescope. I visited it back in 1982 when I was a student. That's me with slightly longer hair. Possibly the same shirt, but yes, longer hair. Back in 1982 I visited the 5 meter telescope dome at Palomar and I thought to myself, yep, that's what I want. Eventually, when I'm grown up, I'm going to have a house with a garden big enough to have a dome like that in the back garden. Okay, I had to downsize slightly. What I actually ended up with was a shed um, with an 8 or a 10 inch telescope in the back and, uh, and roof panels that hinged to allow me to see the sky. So that's what it ended up looking like back in the 1990s. You can judge the, uh, the dating partly from the telescope, but mainly from the fact that the laptop looks like a house brick sitting on the side there, rather than the slimline laptops that we have today. But of course, if you've got a telescope, then you have the ability to look in detail at, for instance, um, the moon. That mustn't be overlooked. Some people love deep sky objects. But you must remember that even our closest neighbour can be absolutely fascinating and some people spend all of their time just looking at the changing moon. Every night is different, arguably every minute, every hour of every night is different as the shadows sh slowly change across the face of the moon. And so you can see structures one night that you perhaps wouldn't have seen uh, a month earlier when the phase of the moon was rather similar. It never quite repeats. And some people love taking images of the moon and building up a mosaic of the, uh, of the entire face of the moon. When I first got my telescope, um, 20 something years ago, maybe 25 years ago, I wondered if it was possible to get images rather than static images. I wondered if you could actually take video. I didn't have a video camera at the time other than the video camera that I used for taking video so I simply took the video camera, an old camcorder as was, and held it up, um, put it on a tripod close to the telescope so the telescope and the video camera were physically disconnected but close to each other and then I took a few seconds of video. You can see Saturn is looking rather ropey there, very grainy, but if you take a few thousand frames and average them out you get a little more detail showing and a little more colour showing and it gets a little closer to what you could expect to see by eye. So again this is not with an astronomical camera, it's just whatever camera that you happen to have, whether it be a still camera or a video camera. So let's come down from the prices because most telescopes are silly money in the sense that a lot of telescopes will be thousands of pounds, the mount might well be thousands of pounds. If we look at what cameras are available to us in terms of commercial cameras. Let's look at some cameras and let's look at the option of not using telescopes for astrophotography but using cameras on trackers. So remember that when we're taking images we are imaging onto a, uh, a photosensitive medium of some kind whether it's uh, film or whether it's a CCD chip inside a digital camera 
both are in principle not sensitive to different colours of light so if you want to take colour images with a black and white film or a black and white monochrome CCD you would use different filters red or green or blue filters and generally speaking you would take a trio of filters to get a, a, a true colour image. Of course you don't have to take red, green and blue filters, you can filter in particular wavelengths if you like and then generate a false colour image as a result. But if you prefer not to take monochromatic film or monochromatic CCD, you could use colour film, which in principle is the same, but the colour filters are then built into the film rather than separate in between the, the lens or the mirror of the optical system and the actual photo detector itself. If we move beyond film into CCDs, the CCD, the charge couple device, is still um, monochromatic but the filters are placed on the front surface in order to make what we call a colour camera. Strictly speaking it's not a colour camera, it's a black and white camera but it has the colour filters um, made in front of each pixel of the CCD chip itself. In other words, if we actually take a chip and actually blow it up and imagine we could see individual pixels, then the arrangement of red and green and blue filters in front of the pixels might look something like this. It will be subtly different for each different type of chip manufacturer, but they all look something like this, a so-called Bayer grid. And so when you take one image, you're actually taking three images at the same time. Red and green and blue images are all acquired at the same time. And the computer knows which filter is in front of which pixel and hence can separate out the red pixels from the green pixels from the blue pixels. And then the computer can integrate these into a colour image. So that's all done for you if you have a colour camera. And... A colour camera such as the one in your phone or the one that you might have in the camera that you use for normal day-to-day -day photography can also be mimicked in, in astro cameras as well. You can buy a monochromatic astro camera or you can buy a colour camera with filters built in. So a small colour camera might cost a few hundred pounds. Um, a colour camera with more pixels might be getting more expensive, we're now moving into thousands of pounds, and relatively large chips that are monochromatic, again, will be perhaps many thousands of pounds. And here, if you wanted to do colour photography, you would put filters in front of the camera. Quite often, this would be done automatically using a motorised filter wheel with a number of different filters, the filters of your choice, perhaps red, green and blue, perhaps filters corresponding to particular elements in the subject you wanted to photograph, the wavelength corresponding to hydrogen or oxygen or sulphur, for instance. So there's a number of different ways you can get into astrophotography if you're happy to pay hundreds or thousands of pounds for the camera as well as the telescope as well as the mount etc. But what, if I, what I wanted to concentrate more on in this particular talk is talking about doing astrophotography without ridiculously expensive equipment. What if you've already got a camera? Maybe you're interested in photography anyway, maybe you're interested in photographing animals or your kids, maybe you're interested in wildlife photography, but if you've already got a camera, the camera might be ideal for daylight photography, but can you use a camera that's optimised for daylight use? Can you still use that for astronomical imaging? And the answer is yes. And the easiest way to do that, apart from just putting a camera on a tripod and taking star trails, is to use one of the simplest ways of getting the camera to track the stars, and that is a little star tracker. So a star tracker is literally just a box with some mechanism inside it, sometimes uh, a motor, sometimes clockwork, that will simply move the camera at the right rate. As the Earth rotates once in 23 hours 56 minutes, if you've got a box that will rotate the camera in the opposite direction once every 23 hours 56 minutes, if you get the axis of rotation lined up with the axis of the Earth, then the camera will effectively track the stars. So that's all a star tracker is, is effectively a motor in a box. I decided to make myself one because I wanted to be able to go on holiday and be able to take images of a dark sky without taking a whole load of equipment with me. 
So I built myself a star tracker, that's what it looks like, it ended up getting the name K2 and a star tracker would cost you, perhaps something like that might cost you about £20 or so to build. I made it out of pieces of aluminium, a couple of AA batteries, a potentiometer and a, a little motor and a few resistors. If anybody's interested, I can show you the, um, how I put that together. I've got a little PDF showing how you can make a star tracker for £20 or so. I used that for many years to take pictures of the sky with my uh, digital SLR camera. And then I decided to move over to a commercial device called a, uh, an Ioptron Sky Tracker. There were lots of companies now. 10 or 20 years ago, there weren't many companies making star trackers, but these days there are lots of companies that make star trackers. That's the one I chose to buy um, something like uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, but there are plenty of other manufacturers. The advantage of this particular one I found at the time was simply that it was relatively small. In other words, there's the tracker inside its case. It's relatively small, it's easy just to throw into your luggage, and so you can take it anywhere when you go nice and easily or when you go on holiday. The tracker, you can see it's being used there in a number of different situations. These are images that I just grabbed off the internet. Uh, people can put uh, a DSLR camera or a bridge camera or a mirrorless camera. Lots of different cameras work quite well. And uh, with a wide angle lens or a telephoto lens on a tracker like this. You notice that on the right hand side here we have a, a polar scope because it is important to make sure that the tracker is lined up with the Earth's axis. So this will sit on a tripod, the camera will mount onto this rotating disc here and the polar scope on the side just allows us to make sure that we're lined up with the Earth's axis. So it will take quite a few kilograms of camera um, here um, I've got my Nikon camera with a telephoto lens. It works perfectly well with everything from very wide angle lenses up to the largest telephoto lens I've tried is a 300 millimeter focal length. This particular tracker can take anything up to about three kilograms of camera lens or even a small telescope if you wanted to try that as well. This is what a tracker might look like inside. This is this particular tracker. They all have a similar sort of design. Basically, it's a, a worm wheel and a worm that's driven through a motor and gearbox. And you can see it's driven, in this case, from a, from a few AA batteries and a little bit of electronics just to make sure it's driving at exactly the right rate such the camera does one revolution in 23 hours, 56 minutes and most of these have a simple reversing switch so that it can be used in the North and Southern Hemisphere. So let's have a look at some of the results of using cameras and trackers. Just to give you an example, if you've never done any image processing before, bear in mind that when you take a picture of the sky, sometimes the results are a little bit um, disappointing. You might look at that and say, well, I thought I was pointing in the direction of the North America nebula, and I think maybe there's a hint of some nebulosity in there, but it's actually rather difficult to see what's going on. When you take a, a, a simple JPEG image or a RAW image, then it is often the case that you'll see the brightest stars, but you won't necessarily see all of the fine detail. But if you take a number of exposures and add them together, the advantage there is that the images of the stars and the nebula will all add up when you add these various images together, but the noise that's an inevitable part of all images will tend to cancel out when you add them together. So by adding a number of images together, so-called stacking, then you start to pull out some of the detail that's in the original image. And once you've got an image in which you can start to see some of the nebulosity, then you can move over to a graphic software of your choice, whatever that might be, and just have a little bit of a play with the colours, just perhaps tweak some of the saturation and play around with the contrast to just bring some of those colours out a little bit better. So now you can see why this particular nebula is called the North American Nebula from the shape that we see here. And you can see that some of the nebulosity that was just visible in the original raw image is the, uh, the, the, the wall that we can see here at the, uh, the Mexico end of the North American Nebula. So bear that in mind. If you go out and snap 
the sky. Don't expect to get fantastic images on the back of your camera. Sometimes you do have to stack a few images together and play around with the, the light levels and the contrast settings before you bring out some of the subtle detail that's in the images that you've captured. But these are images taken from a star party. Do you remember the days before the pandemic when we could go on to star parties? So this was taken in September 2019 where I had a camera and a telephoto lens on a star tracker and tried taking a, pictures, a few pictures that particular night. And you can see that you have a number of objects that, uh, that you can capture without the need for a telescope. You can get, obviously, star clusters. You can get some of the larger galaxies like Andromeda. And here in the top right, we have the Veil Nebula, a supernova remnant. Notice that not only do you get the structure of the supernova remnant, but you get some of the colours coming out as well. It's not usually as good as a dedicated monochromatic camera taken with separate filters, a filter for hydrogen, a filter for oxygen, etc., to bring out the, the red colours for hydrogen, to bring out the cyan colours for oxygen. But even using a camera that's designed for daylight use, and this hasn't been modified for astrophotography in any shape or form. This is the camera I use for daylight photography and it's still able to take pictures of fairly faint objects like the Veil Nebula and bring out their colour without too much noise in the background. This was at a star party where there wasn't too much light pollution. If you're in a light polluted area you will tend to get a bit of glow in the sky but the advantage of digital photography is that can usually be factored out rather more difficult with film because if you've taken a picture on film and the sky comes orange there's not much you can do about that but with digital photography it's relatively straightforward to suppress any background colors in this particular case relatively dark sky it was uh, not jet black but relatively dark taken from uh, the the darker areas of Herefordshire so this is a reminder that a camera on a tracker can produce some very nice images. And essentially the cost involved is whatever you've got in terms of a camera and lenses and £20 for a star tracker. So if that's your budget, £20, you can generate images like this with the camera that you've got. This is a rather older image, it doesn't look quite as good, but this is a picture of the Helix Nebula I took uh, many years ago. The Helix Nebula, if you don't know it, is in uh, the constellation of Aquarius and it's rather low down in the south during the summer months. So we are looking through rather a lot of atmosphere here and this is a crop from a much larger image. But I show it simply because I was pleased to find that the structure of the nebula, this is a planetary nebula, so we're looking at the atmosphere of a star that's been blown away in much the way that the, the sun, when it comes to the end of its life, is going to expand into a red giant and then the outer part of the red giant is going to be blown away. The central core of the sun will become a white dwarf and the outer atmosphere will be blown away and form a planetary nebula much like this particular object here. I show this again because this doesn't require any um, fancy equipment, this is just a camera and a telephoto lens, and I'm not claiming it is anything like as good as the Hubble equivalent image, which you can see on the right hand side here, but bear in mind that the image, the main image that I'm showing that I took was taken with a, with a relatively small amount of additional uh, equipment, whereas the Hubble Space Telescope, okay, much higher resolution, I'll give you that, a much nicer image, but that cost um, something like a few billion dollars, not counting the cost of servicing it. So, if you've seen images that you like, even if they're Hubble images, that doesn't mean you can't take images of those same objects that Hubble has imaged. They won't be as good, but you can take them for yourself with relatively inexpensive hardware. That's the take-home message. Here I tried just to see how far an object I could uh, photograph at the time. I took this um, picture of Markarian's chain. I took a series of two-minute exposures and in this particular case, just let me point out, Markarian's chain is this set of galaxies that you can see in this large sort of arc here, this chain. These two as well are part of the same chain. All of these galaxies appear to be gravitationally bound to each other. 
there's about uh, half a dozen or so in the chain, but there are dozens more when you look in more detail. This particular picture that I took, I think, has got about 50 or so galaxies in it. So at the time I thought to myself, well, these galaxies are quite a few million light years away. But I wonder, what is the most distant object that you can capture with a camera? With this particular camera and this lens, what's the most distant object that I could hope to photograph? 50 million light years is, well, that's, that's impressive, but that's sort of our neighbourhood as far as the universe is concerned. Without moving to a telescope, what's the most distant object I can hope to catch with a camera and a telephoto lens? So I set myself that challenge during the lockdown, because I thought, this is, a good, this is a good lockdown challenge. We were told to continually look down at our feet and make sure we stay two metres away from the person next to us, etc. But Stephen Hawking was saying, don't look down at your feet, look up at the stars. So I thought to myself, yeah, OK, let's look up to the stars and just see how far we can see. So I set myself this challenge. I looked up that there was a galaxy with a very active nucleus, a so-called quasar, that was visible in the constellation of Draco in the middle of the summer. This was the summer of 2020. And so I went out in the middle of summer. Obviously, we don't have much in the way of dark skies. Um, about an hour either side of midnight, I took a series of exposures in a particular part of the constellation of Draco, hoping to catch this particular quasar. The star in the middle there, that's not the quasar, that's a fifth magnitude star. That's one I used just to point at because I knew the quasar wasn't too far away from that in terms of line of sight. I focused the camera on an eighth magnitude star and then I simply took a whole series of exposures. Again, I didn't take, want to take one long exposure. In this particular case, the night had a few clouds scudding by and there were a few aircraft and a few satellites. So I took a large number of 30 second exposures and then afterwards threw away the ones that had a passing aircraft or satellite threw away the ones that had passing clouds, and then added up the remaining images. And that produced the image that you can see there. Now the quasar ought to be somewhere to the right of that star in the middle. That's just a reminder of the setup I had, the camera on a star tracker. And I wanted to look inside that square there because I reckon the quasar, according to the coordinates of this particular galaxy, ought to be in the middle of that square. So I effectively ignored the rest of the image and just looked in detail at what was going on there. And that rather unspectacular speck in the middle there is the quasar that I was searching for. Most of the light from this quasar has been focused into just about one pixel of the 20 megapixel image. There it is blown up a little bit bigger on the left hand side. So it was obviously quite crucial to make sure this was well focused. So the image itself looks probably really, really boring. It is barely a blob of a pixel, plus a few extra pixels perhaps. I brightened this a little bit just to bring out some of the background to make that easier to see. But what is absolutely amazing is not the image itself, but the fact that it's been possible to catch the light from this particular object. Because this camera and telephoto lens have caught the light that has been travelling for 90% of the age of the universe. The look back time, how far back in time am I looking, is approximately 12.4 billion, year, uh, billion years. If you think of the Hubble Deep Field, when the Hubble takes a very deep image, it's looking back in time about 13 billion years. This image is looking back in time 12.4 billion years. The object that I photographed here is approximately 25 billion light years away. The galaxies we saw just a moment ago were tens of millions of light years away. This object is now tens of billions of light years away. And because of the expansion of the universe, because it is so distant, it's effectively on the other side of the observable universe. Because the universe is expanding, this object is actually receding from us at about twice the speed of light. And despite this enormous distance, despite the fact that it's receding at twice the speed of light, despite the fact that the light has taken most of the age of the universe to reach us, 
it's still possible to photograph it using a camera and telephoto lens. The Star Tracker just made that possible by making sure the camera was pointing in roughly the right direction for the two hours or so that I was taking these images. So not aesthetically very pleasing as an image, but in terms of what you can do with a camera that's designed to take daylight images, I think that is absolutely phenomenal. And it was a very interesting lockdown challenge for me. Let's look at the last section here where I show you what you can do if you get the darkest of skies. So I'm interested in astronomy and photography, as most of us, I guess, are. So the red circle and the, and the blue circle here. And of course, astronomy and photography will overlap. You might be interested in visual astronomy. You might be interested in photography. But of course, the overlap is astrophotography. But I'm also interested in taking pictures of animals, observing animals with binoculars and photographing animals. So you can see there's this sort of triad of interest. And that's why, with friends who have similar interest, I have been on safari. Because on safari you can take, you can watch and take images of animals by day, and you can watch and take images of stars by night. Sleep when you get home. Don't waste your time in Africa sleeping when you could be either taking pictures of animals or taking pictures of the sky. So I took this tracker with me. Again, that's one reason I bought a tracker is because if you're going to remote places, it's a lot easier just to throw this into your luggage than it is to think about taking an equatorial mount and even a small telescope. So the camera I was taking anyway, because I wanted the camera to take pictures of zebras and lions and everything else, but I wanted to use that same camera on this tracker to take images of the night sky. Now to make sure it's aligned in the UK, that's dead easy. All you do is get the relevant app on your phone that tells you, because the app knows from GPS where you are and it knows accurately the time, it can tell you if you're at this location on the Earth, at this longitude and latitude, and the current time is this, then Polaris ought to be in this position. In other words, if you're looking through the polar scope, if the North Celestial Pole is the center of the crosshairs. If you are looking correctly at the North Celestial Pole, then Polaris, which is slightly off the pole, ought to appear at this particular location in the reticle that you're looking through. It gives you a little dot telling you where Polaris is. So in other words, if you're in the UK, you simply set this on your tripod and adjust the tripod until Polaris is in that position there, then you know you're lined up accurately with the North Celestial Pole. That's actually very straightforward in the UK and just takes a few seconds or so. But bear in mind that if you are going to go on holiday, there's the North Celestial Pole, which of course is directly above the North Pole of the Earth. If we're at latitudes such as the UK, then at 50 or so degrees north, Polaris is some 50 or so degrees above the horizon, very easy to align on. But if you're going to Kenya or Tanzania, which are in East Africa, essentially on the equator, then Polaris is either very close or actually on the horizon and is going to be hidden behind hills or elephants or something else. And it doesn't help that the South Pole is the same, even though in principle you could line up on the South Pole, the North Pole is on one horizon and the South Pole is on the other horizon. So you, if you want to do polar alignment, you can't rely on seeing where Polaris is or seeing where Sigma Octans is. You have to come up with more creative ways of aligning your equatorial mount or your star tracker. I'm not going to go into details, but if anybody's interested, I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A afterwards. I tried taking a picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud wasn't entirely successful because the large and small Magellanic clouds are actually quite close to the South Pole. So on the equator, they never get very far from the South Pole and therefore they ne never get very far from the horizon. So again, we're looking through quite a bit of atmosphere when we're trying to catch the Magellanic clouds. But I did want to catch a swathe of the Milky Way, so I, I made a mosaic in this case, I was using a 35mm lens and I took a series of one minute exposures and then made a mosaic of a particular patch of Milky Way that we can't see from the UK. 
we can see the northern part of the Milky Way down to approximately the centre of the galaxy, but we can't see any further than that, and this is the region further than the centre of the galaxy. So over on the left-hand side here we have Alpha and Beta Centauri, and as we move across there we get the Southern Cross, uh, Southern Cross the constellation of Crooks, uh, a little cluster there, the Jewel Box Cluster, and the large dark nebula, the Coal Sack, sitting right next to Crooks. And if we go further across, we get to the uh, rather spectacular nebula of uh, Eta Carina or Eta Carinae. This is a very unstable star that seems to be shedding a lot of its material, a lot of its outer atmosphere, and is a good candidate for one of the stars that could go supernova before too long. It appears to be a, a rather unstable phase of its existence. In order to try and give you just a taste of what it's like to see the Milky Way out in Africa, this is my attempt. This is uh, the Milky Way uh, as you might see it with your naked eye as seen from England. You can see certain patches of the Milky Way, you can see certain areas of brightness, and you get a hint of the, some of the structure that's in there. But the Milky Way as seen from Africa shows an enormous amount of detail just with the naked eye. It's been said that uh, on a clear night, if you can go out on a night which doesn't have any moon, you can still see the stars and the Milky Way cast shadows. The brightness is absolutely phenomenal if you can get somewhere where the nearest street light is a hundred miles away or something like that. So, of course, you can see an enormous amount of detail in terms of the bright areas, the bright star fields and the intricate structure of the dark dust lanes that are threading through the entire Milky Way. But of course with astrophotography you then have the advantage of putting colour into the equation and then seeing what's going on there. So you can see that this was a mosaic of a few images taken with a 35mm wide angle lens. If we compare that with one of my very earliest attempts to take a picture of the sky, this was taken with ISO 200 slide film uh, with a camera on a tripod untracked for just, uh, just a few minutes. So each of the stars has moved a little bit, but the point here is that we can see the brightest stars, and perhaps you can make out easily the bright stars of Scorpius here, and the bright stars of the teapot of Sagittarius over here, but you can only just make out a hint of the Milky Way. And that's the result of using slide film and an exposure of just a few minutes. But if you think about the Milky Way, now we have an enormous amount of detail in the Milky Way taken with a two set of two-minute exposures. And there is so much detail in an image like that, it's sometimes difficult to see where the stars are. So although the bright stars show up nicely when there's only bright stars visible, for the equivalent on the right-hand side, we virtually have to join the dots to realise that that's where Scorpius is. It's there, but there were so many fainter stars, in addition to the bright Antares and Rhoophusius and all the other clusters that we can see in there, because there's so much of the fainter part of the Milky Way showing up, it's sometimes so confusing you can barely make out even the brighter constellations. If we just have a look at part of that image, we realise that as well as seeing uh, Antares and the rest of Scorpius, we have another couple of interlopers in here. We have the very bright Jupiter, which is so bright it's almost like light pollution when you're looking at an image like this. And we also have uh, Saturn. These images were taken in uh, 2019 when Jupiter and Saturn were not that far apart and relatively close to the centre of the galaxy. But when taking an image like this, again, there's a huge amount of detail because it doesn't take long before you realise that you've got a huge number of nebulae and star clusters. And if you're taking images with a 35mm lens with a reasonable number of megapixels, you can see detail in all of these objects. I'm just going to label some of them with their Messier numbers. I'm not even going to attempt to put the NGC numbers in as well because there are just far too many of them. It looks like all the interesting clusters come to an end at some point and implying that there were the no interesting clusters or nebulae beyond that point. But of course there are. It's just that Messier couldn't see that far south when he did his observing from France. And so the Messier numbers run out, even though the interesting objects continue onward. 
But having taken a wide angle of this chunk of sky and getting a beautiful image of the Milky Way and all of its interesting, delicate, dust lane structures, I did wonder whether or not it was worth changing from a wide angle lens to a telephoto just to get a little more information out of some nebulae. So I thought, well, we've got the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula there, so why not swap the wide angle lens for a telephoto lens and try uh, a few images? On this particular night I didn't have that long, so I tried just a single image, a single 30 second image, and that's what you get from the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula in a single 30 second exposure with a telephoto lens on the, on the Star Tracker. And I was quite pleased with that, given that it was just a single, uh, excuse me, just a single image. But I thought, isn't it nice that the colours do actually come out? If we look at the Triffid Nebula there, you realise that the pinks and the blues, as well as the actual trefoil nature of the Triffid itself, the pinks and the blues do actually come out. And again, a camera designed for daylight photography is capable of picking up colours in astronomical objects. So there's the take-home message. If you want to do astrophotography, and if you want to do it from a dark sky site, and you don't want to have to take large, heavy, expensive equipment with you, bear in mind one option is just to pick up a star tracker, build one yourself for 20 quid, or buy yourself a star tracker, and whenever you're going anywhere where there's dark skies, you can take beautiful images without spending the earth. Thank you all for listening.